Happy Saturday. We are following last week's Saturday Classic with another about Hawaii. Today's is on Queen Liliuokalani, who was the last monarch of Hawaii, and her attempts to resist the overthrow of her government by United States business interests who were backed by the U.S. Army. This episode is from July 2010 with previous hosts Katie and Sarah. Enjoy! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Katie Lambert. And I'm Sarah Dowdy. In our last podcast, we talked about Kamehameha the Great and the formation of the monarchy, and we may have mangled a few Hawaiian pronunciations. We certainly pronounced our vowels <laughs> thoroughly. <laughs> But how did it all end, and why is a far-flung island grouping in the middle of the Pacific a state? That's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to go back to a point we mentioned in the earlier podcast, and actually a point we mentioned in a podcast a long time ago on breadfruit and the mutiny on the bounty, and that's Captain Cook's arrival in Hawaii, and that marks the beginning of a century of westernization in the islands, and we have explorers arriving, traders, adventurers, all coming to Hawaii, and we also have some stuff that fundamentally changes the the life of people on the island. Right, like uh, livestock and frame houses, Protestant and Catholic religion, taverns, written language. Yeah, but it's not until the middle of the 19th century that European and American interests really start to exert a pretty large amount of control over the islands. And the white interest centers around business, and it's mostly sugar trade stuff. And these business interests gradually force the monarchy to transform, to give up power, like bit by bit. It goes on for a long time. But by 1848, King Kamehameha III allows the Great Mehele, which is the division of lands, to take place. And this allows people to own private property. I mean, this is a really great example, too, of fundamental life changes for Native Hawaiians. At the time, Hawaii was still certainly its own country, but there are loads of different foreign nations exerting influence in the islands. It's not just the United States. And in fact, the U.S. is pretty disenchanted with the idea of possibly annexing the islands when King Kamehameha III secretly petitions the government to make it happen. And he's met with a very definitive reply from Secretary of State Daniel Webster, No power ought to take possession of the islands as a conquest or colonization. But by the 1870s, that's starting to change a bit. And U.S. dominance in Hawaii is becoming very obvious. It's taking precedence to other countries' dominance. And this is really proven by the Reciprocity Treaty, which allowed for free trade of sugar to the United States and in return the right for America to establish a naval base at Pearl Harbor. So it was a very good deal for these sugar merchants in Hawaii because they could do all their trading and not have to pay a bunch of tariffs on it. The 1875 treaty had been supported by Hawaii's new king, David Kalakaua, but the businessmen didn't quite trust him because he was building up the royalty, you know, constructing a palace and reviving Hawaiian traditions that had been forced underground, like the hula. So in 1889, the Honolulu Rifles, a group of white troops, forced him to ratify a new constitution known as the Bayonet Constitution, which strips his powers, loads his cabinet with white businessmen, and limits the voting rights of natives. So now to vote, you don't have to be a citizen, but you have to own property and make more than $600 a year. So this disenfranchises most Hawaiian natives. But this is the state of the country when Kalakaue's sister, Lilio Kolani, takes the throne in 1891. And She was born in 1838. She was the third of 10 children born to a high chief, and she was adopted at birth and educated very well at the Royal School, which was run by American missionaries. And she was even given a Christian name, Lydia, marries a white man, John Owen Dominus, who later becomes an island governor. So just to give you some background on her, she's very intelligent, she's very well educated, and she's been thoroughly schooled in how to be a modern, dignified lady, but she doesn't ever really forget her Hawaiian background. She continues to speak the native language. She likes to practice native customs. She's 
aware of her heritage. And while she hadn't had much experience governing, she had already proven herself more loyal to her people than business interests. She'd been left in charge for a time in 1881 when her brother went on an international journey. And when an epidemic of smallpox struck the island, which was ultimately traced to Chinese laborers, she responded by shutting down the port. Businessmen completely freaked out, but she stood her ground. And When she becomes queen, it's no surprise that she immediately starts looking for a way to overturn the unfair bayonet constitution. There's another really important economic development that's going on around the same time that seals Hawaii's fate, and that's the revocation of the free and favored entry status for the sugar exports. So in 1890, with the passing of the McKinley Tariff, sugar growers can no longer make these huge profits they've been used to. They don't have this completely free trade with the U.S. anymore, and it causes a recession on the island. Hey, then would it perhaps be easier for them, Sarah, if Hawaii were part of the United States? Yes, it certainly would. You wouldn't have tariffs if you, too, were part of the United States. So these sugar growers are starting to think, let's get Hawaii annexed. In 1893, the queen is ready to introduce her new constitution. And fearing trouble, her advisors have her hold back a few days. But trouble is brewing. Yeah, the businessmen aren't pleased that Lilia Wokalani is unwilling to be cowed. And they're making plans to form the Committee on Annexation and overthrow her. And the perfect opportunity for this comes January 16th, 1893, when four boats of U.S. Marines with guns disembark in Honolulu. So you have all of these troops now who might support this American-led uprising. So 162 troops march through Honolulu streets toward the palace, and the queen watches from her balcony. The next day, she surrenders at gunpoint and cedes control to the island's wealthy white sugar growers who are going to form this temporary government. So we have a bloodless coup. And Sanford Dole, as in Dole Pineapples, establishes a temporary government and petitions the U.S. to annex Hawaii with the Committee on Annexation. He claims the government is corrupt and that they're trying to advance democracy. And he's supported by the U.S. minister to Hawaii, John Stevens. Next, Stevens recognizes the new government and proclaims Hawaii a U.S. protectorate all without the permission of the U.S. State Department. Which is crazy. I, I still can't get over that part. But Benjamin Harrison, who is president, is game with all this, even though it is defying any kind of structure or order. And he signs the Treaty of Annexation and sends it to the Senate. But wait, but (laughs) we have had an election by this point. And before the Senate can ratify the treaty, we get a new president, Grover Cleveland, who withdraws the treaty for the purpose of re-examination. So Cleveland appoints James Blount to investigate what actually happened. And Blount finds that Stevens had acted improperly, obviously, and there's no reason that American flags should be flying over Hawaiian government buildings, and also decides We need to restore the queen. What happened was wrong. So Sanford Dole, however, is not willing to let go. And he says, no, I'm not going to give power back to the queen. And he argues that the U.S. has no right to interfere with what's going on in Hawaii. So he's extremely defiant. The new American minister under President Cleveland, Albert S. Willis, offers the crown back to the queen on the condition that she pardon those who dethroned her. She says no and then changes her mind, but the delay compromises her position, and Cleveland releases the entire issue to Congress for debate. So annexationists lobby Congress against the restoration of the monarchy. They ultimately vote to censure Stevens for his disobedience, but they're still pretty open to the idea of annexation, and the United States won't move to help the queen in any way. So on July 4th, 1894, the provisional government proclaims Hawaii as a republic, and Sanford Dole declares himself president without a vote. And He's got some nerve. Yeah, he really does, and pineapples. And the new Republic of Hawaii is immediately recognized by the U.S. So we go from this limbo 
limbo state where they're hoping that they'll become part of the United States to actually being a republic, their their own country, but it's a country ruled by businessmen. The queen has not lost hope. She still has faith that Cleveland will restore her to the throne. And she retains her title, but no power. Eventually, her supporters try to rise up for her, but when some are found on the beach with a shipment of guns, her house is searched and more weapons are found in her garden. She's held captive in the palace for months and eventually gives up her title on January 24, 1895, with the promise that her arrested supporters wouldn't be killed. Most are anyway. And Native Hawaiians are very, very much against the takeover. Don't think otherwise. I I ran into some accounts about – I don't even think I learned about this really in U.S. history. But I ran into some accounts saying that it's glossed over oftentimes and that it's taught like Hawaiians really wanted to become part you of the United States. Hawaiians. That was not the case. Um, so – they're staging rallies and forming men's and women's groups against annexation. Their princess and the heir to the throne actually goes to New York and D.C. She's fresh from nine years of boarding school in England, so she's very charming and eloquent. And she wins a lot of hearts and minds. She speaks to the newspaper men and gives them the idea that uh, – The Hawaiians are nothing like what they've been led to believe. She even meets with the president, but it's not enough to really make things happen. The Republican Party platform in the election of 1896 is very pro-annexation, so when their candidate, McKinley, is inaugurated in March 1897, It's really no surprise that he restarts the process. He and three representatives from the Republic of Hawaii sign a treaty of annexation and submit it to the Senate. So the men's and women's groups in Hawaii swing into action. They order a mass petition and between September and October 1897 collect 21,269 signatures. And that's of 39,000 Native Hawaiians. And they also send four delegates to D.C. with the petition. And the queen is already there lobbying and preparing a strategy. And the delegation meets with the chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations on December 9th. And the senator reads the text of the petition to the Senate. It's formally accepted. So good they're, work. Good yeah, they're doing work. really good work here. And the next day, the delegates meet with the secretary of state and formally protest annexation. And from there, they go crazy lobbying all sorts of senators trying to oppose this as furiously as they can. And by the time they leave on February 27th, 1898, only 46 senators are willing to vote for annexing Hawaii. So they've really made a huge difference because that is not enough for a two-thirds majority. So the treaty is defeated. But February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine blows up in the Havana Harbor. The Spanish-American War starts, some of which takes place in the Philippines, and now we need a mid-Pacific fueling station and naval base. So pro-annexation groups decide to resubmit the proposal, playing up the fears of war and the possibility that the Japanese will do it first. This time, it's a joint resolution, which requires a simple majority instead of that two-thirds majority. And the Newlands Resolution passes and is signed into law by McKinley in 1898. Hawaii is now part of the United States. And Cleveland actually later wrote of this, I'm ashamed of the whole affair. So this was not something that everyone in the United States was celebrating. And back in Hawaii, obviously, everyone who supported the royal family is in deep mourning. Um, The queen and her heir focus on trying to secure voting rights for the people now that They are part of the United States. And the queen also writes songs for the rest of her life, something that she did before as well. But she was really good at blending Native Hawaiian and Western styles together. And her most famous song is Aloha Way. And she's also responsible for writing one of Hawaii's uh, national anthems. So the queen lived a long time. We bid goodbye to her November 11th, 1917, at the age of 79. But she didn't live long enough to see statehood for Hawaii, which didn't come until 1959. 
And that, of course, gave people living in Hawaii full rights as American citizens. And we have one more little note on this. In the 1980s, a sovereignty movement started in Hawaii. And some people wanted a restoration of the monarchy. Others wanted some sort of reparations. Some people wanted Hawaii to become its own nation. And others wanted Hawaii to uh, have the Native people at least receive the same sort of federal recognition that Native Americans receive. Queen Lilia Wokalani's story obviously inspired this movement, but it also won our respect and admiration. And that is the story of the last Queen of Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 